So here's just a quick agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about our program, and then we're going to have the actual panel itself, maybe around 30 minutes, and then we'll get to most of your questions in the live Q&A, and then we'll just have a little bit of closeout slides, and we'll be good to go. So this is a little bit about our program. We have multiple offerings. You can take our class one year full-time, you can do two years part-time, or you could even do two years in person. Our one-year program is entirely offered in person. Now, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the cohort sizes. The class in general should be between 30 to 40 students, right? Your graduating class. We have foundations classes, and these are there's two of them. We call these a multi-layered approach to bioethics, and these you'll be in class with 30 or 40 students. Then we also break out into the core classes, intro to research ethics, intro to clinical ethics, and health law and policy. And these might have around 30 students as well. <clears throat> the next set of classes that really make up, <clears throat> excuse me, the bulk of your program are elective classes. And this is your opportunity to partake in classes offered by the wider medical school catalog, the School of Public Health, um, and the law school. And to really close out your curriculum as well, of course, we have a capstone experience. Um, and your capstone is a hands-on ethics experience um, that you can tailor to your professional experience, um, your professional expertise, and your interests as well. Just a little bit about our class. About We have about right now 120 students. Um, 32 of which are full-time, and our students come from 27 countries, which is pretty incredible. Our students are clinicians, they're lawyers, um, they're pastors, they're public health and public law professionals. They're working in the pharmaceutical industry, or maybe they're taking a gap year in med school. Um, and some of our students are also just starting their career, while others have been in their fields for 20 plus years. And we're going to hear from some of them today. So a little bit about life here at Harvard. Um, you can, of course, right, come study in person. That's here in Boston. That's on the Longwood campus. Uh, you can live in or around Cambridge and then commute in to our Longwood campus right near Fenway. Um, or if you're studying in person, then you could even live right here on campus at the Vanderbilt Hall. And really quick, as you've seen here, we are going to jump right into our alumni panel because some of the questions that we get asked most are, what can I do with the program? How can it influence my career? How could it help me change my career? So that's what we really wanted to share with you today. So I wanna get right to it and start our alumni panel. Um, we're very lucky to have our moderator with us today. That's Dr. Rebecca Brendel and Dr. Brindell is actually the director of the Master of Bioethics degree program, and she's the associate director of the Center for Bioethics. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and actually open it up to the panelists that we have here to please introduce yourselves, and then we'll get rolling with the panel. Thank you. Ngaki, I'm not sure if you want to go first. Yes, happy to introduce myself. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, information session. Uh, my name is Gaki Masunga, and I am a recent grad of the MB program. I graduated in 2021, and I was part of the two-year part-time program, and I'm currently a postgraduate research fellow at the Harvard Medical School. Great. Uh, Jesse, I can see everyone, so I'll take over. Kayla, um, welcome back. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Let's see. So I was a full-time student. I graduated in 2020, and I'm currently a clinical ethicist for Providence St. Joseph Health. Sorry, and if we can try to get people's cameras on as we move into the panel, that would be great. Um, 
Uh, next, uh, Vince, uh, can you introduce yourself? Hey, good morning. I'm Chaplain Vince Bain. I'm a chaplain in the United States Army, and I'm presently assigned at Walter Reed National Medical Center in the Washington, D.C. area. And in my position as the bioethics chaplain for the installation, I'm also the co-chair of the Healthcare Ethics Committee, and I serve on the IRB, and I also advise the DE&I Council on all their activities. And I'm not allowed to start my video. Oh, wait, now it's there. Great. And we're going to ask all our participants, let's see if we can start videos. There we go. Okay. And Hajang, good morning. It's early for you. <laughs> yes, it's 6 uh, a.m. here. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Hajang Lee. I'm an assistant professor in uh, religion, spirituality, and society, and the bioethics program at University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Great. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And it's really nice to see so many familiar faces first thing in the morning uh, to talk about our program. So um, we are so excited to hear about your experiences in the program. And I know very shortly, uh, prospective students in the program are going to start populating the Q&A box to add to our um, conversation. But um, maybe we could start just with a couple of questions for um, a couple questions uh, uh, to get us going about each of your unique experiences and what brought you to the program. So maybe we could start with um, Kayla and talk about how the uh, master's in bioethics program prepared you for your current role as a clinical ethicist and how you brought your background in nursing to the MBE program. Yeah, absolutely. So I came to the MBE program, um, like Dr. Brendel mentioned, with a nursing career background. And I had sensed kind of these different ethical issues at the bedside, but I didn't really know how to name them, how to put words to them, how to talk through them. So it was really incredibly helpful to get to join the MBE program. And I feel like it was just this year steeped in learning that I reference back to all the time in my career now. So I started a PhD program that I'm still working on. And in the meantime, I was really lucky to earn a or land a clinical ethicist position. So what I do now very much relates to the MBE in terms of, um, let's see, I carry a pager, I take consults all day. I'm teaching medical residents who um, are internal medicine residents and ED residents as well. I'm doing like all kinds of education across our system. And a lot of the people that I teach or work with are learners. And what's so helpful is that I was so recently a medical person learner myself, right? So when I teach nurses, when I teach residents, I'm very easily able to put myself back in their shoes. And I learned, I use so many of the techniques that I was taught while I was at Harvard um, Center for Bioethics. Just thinking about how a lot of learning bioethics is not only learning the technical pieces, learning the background, learning the current up-to-date content, but also learning how to process, you know, things like moral distress or things like, you know, really tough issues at the bedside where maybe, yes, we're talking about um, withdrawing treatment on a patient, but we're also talking about kind of the lived experience of someone who works at the bedside. So what I really appreciated about my master's program was that I felt like it included both of those pieces. I found a lot of great mentors through the master's of bioethics program who really showed me what doing clinical ethics work is like. So I feel like I went in definitely prepared and I use so many little tidbits uh, that everyone taught me along the way. So definitely would recommend it. Thanks so much. And we're going, I want to sort of go to Ha Zhang for a minute because you complete, completed the program part-time while you were also completing your PhD and uh, then took a somewhat different path into academia, but very much informed by an interest in, in, clin in clinical work. So maybe you could tell us a little bit, Ha Zhang, about how the program has influenced your career now as a full-time teacher and scholar of bioethics yourself. Uh, so I had a, a back, like educational background in biomedical engineering, law, theology, uh, before I enrolled my PhD program in um, religious studies. 
And I went to one of the um, ethics conferences and I talked about my background and somebody introduced me about bioethics and um, I was persuaded to become a bioethicist and it sounded fascinating and I was asking people like how I can study bioethics from now and they recommended me to go to the bioethics conference so I went to the ASBH and then I found the, the Harvard booth there and they said they may launch the new program so I'm waiting um, for the for the school to launch the program so like I was click on their web web page like almost every day and then uh, I enrolled as an inaugural um, class and I was probably the first one who took an interview because <laughs> like waiting and like wrote my application overnight when they um, uploaded the application and I was like very excited and I was already like in the PhD program in Boston area so it worked out very well and um, I mean without this program don't think I could become a like bioethicist because when I went to the, the conference, uh, bioethics is an interdisciplinary field and there are so many topics and so many things going on and I was really overwhelmed and then realized that uh, how can I get like foundation <laughs> in bioethics and uh, when I took those classes, like it gave me really uh, solid knowledge in uh, bioethics. And plus uh, I was able to serve um, uh, um, IRB at Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, Hospital Ethics Committee at uh, MGH. And uh, those experiences were like very, very valuable. And to see like what is going on like in research ethics and clinical ethics. So uh, without uh, this program, I don't think I can teach and research like now uh, at my current institution. So I really, really appreciate the program. So I strongly recommend that like whoever you are in full-time, part-time, uh, I think it's doable and uh, you can get a lot out of that. Great, thanks so much. And maybe we'll come back and hear a little bit about what you're teaching in your program now. I wanna um, go to um, Gaki for a minute and uh, hear about your perspective in how your commitment to and research in global health uh, was influenced by participating in the master's program. And you still, uh, in, in about an hour, you're going to be uh, helping to teach in our global health ex ethics course too. So um, still still in the middle of the MBE program. So tell us a little bit, Geki, about your experience. Uh, yes, so I came to the MBE program from a public health background. I worked for a chronic disease epidemiology lab uh, prior to starting my graduate studies. And I actually started um, my graduate studies with, with um, a master's in public health. So I was in the middle of that public health program um, when I applied to the MBE program. And I found out about the MB program actually from a, a classmate in my biostatistics and epidemiology class. And at the time, I was um, designing my thesis where I was doing a comparative an, um, analysis between models that were employed uh, by African and Southeast Asian countries to eliminate a neglected tropical disease called leishmaniasis. And as I was designing the study, I realized that there are a lot of ethical challenges present in the efforts to prevent and treat neglected tropical diseases. And I really wanted to explore this more, but I didn't know how to do this. So when I met um, this classmate who was studying bioethics, it immediately clicked for me. And I knew that this is a program that I felt would be really beneficial to, um, to take concurrently with my public health program. So I applied to the program and I was admitted to, um, to do the program part-time so I could, um, I could also concurrently uh, do the public, complete my public health um, uh, program as well. So while I was a student, I, it, was, it was a really beautiful match for me because um, I was able to add on a bioethics um, component to the, um, to, the, to the project I was already working on for my other programs. So uh, for my capstone, I um, explored um, the ethics around the prioritization of global health issues and how global health policies are implemented in relation to the socioeconomic status of affected populations. Um, and this is because um, neglected tropical diseases affect um, a billion of the world's poorest, um, world's poorest. 
Um, so if I can talk a little bit after after I graduated, as, as um, Dr. Brindell uh, mentioned, I've stayed on as a research fellow in the department. And um, I've been really able to tap into the world of global health bioethics um, and discover how to create synergy between public health and bioethics. So as an example, one of the research projects I'm currently working on is, as a fellow is to create an African specific big data commons to better understand the determinants of cardiometabolic diseases and mental health outcomes across Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a huge um, initiative and collaborative among um, um, institutions here in Boston and um, across Afri four African countries. Um, and um, it use, it's, we're trying to use smartphone technology to collect and analyze epidemiological data from participants in these African countries. And as a PI of the study, I am conceptualizing the design of the bioethics research arm of the study to analyze important ethical research questions related to the impact of ethical data collection and use in Africa. So merging the fields of public health and bioethics has, has also enabled me to present my work at conferences that um, not only focus on public health, but uh, bioethics as well at the WHO and, and Oxford as well. Great. Um, thank you so much. And really also uh, so far, um, all the diverse experiences and the different ways in which our alums bring bioethics um, into their own practice. And in fact, day by day, every day, expanding the scope of the field and, um, and where we can, uh, where bioethics can take us and how it can change the world. So I want to um, go uh, next to Vince um, and to ask you about uh, your experience in the program and how it's influenced your work and, and your career as an Army chaplain. Very good. Great question. I will start this with a long story to get to that point. The United States Army has two slots for bioethics chaplains across the entire force. And we're talking a force in excess of 1 million people. And there are only two slots in the United States Army for a bioethicist. And it is a very competitive position. And when I was selected for that, I immediately dove into let's find a school that's got a fantastic bioethics program, realizing I was going to be working at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. It is believed to be the premier medical installation for all Department of Defense personnel. And going there, I knew I was going to be uh, getting in way over my head unless I was significantly academically prepared for the opportunities. And uh, the MBE program gave me a great foundation on which to slide right into this position here at Walter Reed. Of course, I wish I would have taken different electives, but um, if I would have known more uh, broadly what the position was going to entail, I would have probably selected the electives a little bit differently. Although I've been very pleased with how I've been able to integrate within the organization at Walter Reed. And I am now serving as the co-chair for the Healthcare Ethics Committee. And there's three different subcommittees that fall under this. Although one of the main programs we're looking at putting back is an annual ethics symposium. This went dark during the height of COVID because they weren't able to conduct this in person. So we're bringing that back as a, a hybrid this coming fall. We're also going to be bringing online and uh, kind of a brown bag lunch you know, edible ethics, or I've got to get it a better name than that. Although a virtual opportunity once a month to bring in a, a guest speaker, give a short presentation, and then open it up to everyone who's in the virtual sphere to kind of ask questions about whatever uh, present ethical, medical ethical topic that is uh, at, of interest within Walter Reed and across the Department of Defense. And I'm also working on a, a research project with a number of the residents. We're looking at medical ethical situations that have occur occurred in deployment settings, because as we have no longer a significant deployed military, we're losing that knowledge as those individuals leave the force, either transitioning into civilian positions or retiring. And we'd like to grab that information and from that make a pre-deployment training protocol that allows our providers that have never deployed to understand some of the ethical challenges that exist in providing medical care in a combat casualty situation. We're mirroring a program, or not mirroring, but kind of building on some work that's been done by the British military. 
and I've had an opportunity to sit in with their ethics committee as they've talked about the program that they have made. So we're trying to do something that is similar. Uh, that's just one of the many projects we've got going on. And then I'm also serving on the IRB, which is very interesting because as a number of the other people on the IRB have told me, I don't have any medical knowledge. And I, I'm sure them that's, that's quite all right because uh, most of what the, most of the programs we're looking at or all the proposals are using military service members as their participant pool, seen as how I am one of those. And as a chaplain, I do it, I advocate for the care of soldiers. I have a very unique perspective in understanding the impact that the participation of service members have, especially in a very paternalistic organization with some of the most compliant individuals that exist because we are used to answering yes and positively for all that we're ordered to do. So that is certainly something to be concerned about as that pool is looked at as research participants. So those are a few of the items I'm also involved in. And of course, I had the opportunity and invited to uh, advise the DEI Council on ethical issues as they roll out and expand the DEI program at Walter Reed. So I've had an opportunity to sit in on their discussions also. And I would say uh, every one of the classes that I took in the MBE program has at, applied in some way, shape, or form to this very diverse job that I have at Walter Reed. And I've, I'm thankful for that. And as a Dr. Brindell can tell you, I do reach back quite frequently to get answers to questions to her and Dr. Berry and some of the other instructors because it's uh, um, the program is like standing in front of a fire hydrant trying to get a drink and it wasn't able to take it all in. But uh, the key is I know who to reach back to and ask the questions to. So that has been the greatest help since I've been uh, actively engaged in this position here at Walter Reed. So pending, over. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Vince. And um, thanks for bringing that perspective. So we're going to round out our panel with Leanne Homan, who I believe is a 2020 graduate of our program and um, came in as a practicing nurse and now has really shifted her career to be a clinical ethicist and serving as the associate director of clinical ethics at our center. So um, welcome, Leanne. We're so pleased you're joining us. And I'm uh, hoping you could say a little bit about how the Master of Bioethics program influenced your career um, and your and uh, your own practice as a nurse. Sure. Thanks, Brenda. And I mean, Becca. And thank you for the introduction. It makes my life easier to not have to introduce myself. Um, as Becca said, I came into the program as a registered nurse. I had been a nurse uh, in 2020 for nine. Uh, 17 years um, and, you know, really um, the last probably four years of my career was looking for a shift um, away from the bedside. And uh, to be honest, it was because of the moral distress that I was experiencing every single day at work. Um, and instead of running away from the career of nursing, and as I would say, I wanted to be um, become a florist. I figured instead of running from the feelings that I was experiencing, I would learn a little bit more about it and try to figure out how to process it um, and process these feelings. So I uh, started in the program. I was part time because I was also working full time and that was and, you know, have a family. And that was the only way that I thought it would be manageable. Um, and and you know, I'm super grateful for the program. I'm confident that I would not be in the role um, that I am today without the program. Um, as Becca said, I'm a clinical nurse ethicist here in an academic, academic medical center in Boston. There's two of us for the entire medical center. Um, uh, a requirement is to either have a master's in bioethics or graduate from the fellowship program that is also offered at HMS. Um, and I kind of fell into this role because this is where I did my capstone project. And through the relationships that I made and the networking and the um, constant contact of the folks in the ethics community, I, you know, kind of got into this, this role, it just happenstance. Um, and again, I'm super grateful and can confidently say I wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for the program. So, yes, thanks. Great. 
So um, that brings us into, there are so many things. So just to highlight about the, um, how special the program is really by virtue of uh, the community that we've created between the faculty and the students and the unique perspective experience that each, um, each student in the program brings to the work. So um, this is just the beginning, almost the, the tip of the iceberg, but if we had five other alums, uh, we would hear um, even more stories about both how transformative the degree can be, as well as backgrounds um, and interests that came into the program. So one of, the, one of the things that we hear in our exit surveys um, every year from our students is the importance of the capstone experience uh, in helping. We've already heard, Leanne, about how you credit the capstone with your next career move. That's not uncommon, although not everybody does. I'm wondering also um, about, um, about others' capstone experience. I think um, maybe Gaki will go to you and you could tell us a little bit about how your work has developed since the capstone and uh, maybe something about mentorship and research as part of that as well, if you'd like. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I, the, uh, research advisor that I was assigned for my capstone um, has continued to mentor me uh, in my in my fellowship now, and uh, it was very instrumental in a way that he helped me craft uh, my question for the research project that I worked on during my capstone. And as a result of that, we were able to publish a paper together and then um, think through how I wanted to continue working um, not only on the new project that I just talked about um, on focusing on non-communicable diseases, but also continuing another research pro project um, with um, focusing on neglected tropical diseases. So um, for the NT, for my neglected tropical disease project, I added a health policy arm. So I'm looking at a policy that was implemented um, about a decade ago to try by Congress um, to try and incentivize drug companies to create drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics for um, these diseases that affect a billion people in the world. But there's not really um, a lot of focus on on drugs uh, for these diseases. So um, However, in 2020, right, right before the pandemic started, the Government Accountability Office um, did an audit of this policy and found that it hadn't had the intended effect that they had hoped. And um, they provided um, some reasons that they thought could be, could be, could be a, the reason for, for um, drug companies not being incentivized. And what I'm doing for my, in my fellowship is looking at um, the audit, uh, doing a deep dive in the audit and seeing how, um, what specific areas I can focus on to see if we can make, if I can propose um, changes to the to the way the policy was crafted to see if it can have a better impact for um, creating drugs for these diseases. So that's a, one way that I've um, continued what I, I started in the capstone and now um, on my fellowship as well. Great, thanks so much. And, and another piece of the capstone that um, we hear is so important is the mentorship that comes along with it. And we've heard that from you. Um, Kayla, I was hoping maybe you could tell us about your mentor. And you know, uh, we have some a question in the chat box too about uh, what it's like being a nurse in the program and whether that background um, and experience is, is valued and uh, what mentorship might look like. So I thought you might be able to tell us a little bit about your experience. Absolutely. I found myself very lucky to have two mentors. One of them was Dr. Jennifer McGurl and the other one was Dr. Amy Milliken. And Jennifer was a neonatologist physician and Amy Milliken is a nurse ethicist. I still text Amy probably once a week, um, whether we're talking about, you know, just sending photos of her very cute young son, or if we're talking about, you know, needing help on a consultation that I'm facing. And I think I found that, you know, whether or not the person that you are matched up with as a mentor is still working with the center or if they've moved clear across the world, 
they will stay in touch with you. At least that's been my experience. And they're incredibly helpful in terms of, gosh, I mean, letters of rec, advice along the way. I really do feel like that was one of the most beneficial pieces. Um, and really that relationship is fostered through the capstone. So my capstone project was looking at shared decision-making in the labor and delivery uh, birth setting, looking at how we can include pregnant people more in conversations around what's gonna happen next in their birth process, which is really handy because when I'm at work, I get ethics consults from obstetricians saying, hey, you know, we need ethics help. This patient, let's say, doesn't want an IV, doesn't want a C-section, but we think it's an urgent, right? Like, what do we do next? How do we think about consent in these contexts? Um, I mean, just so many questions around really any piece of medicine you could focus your capstone on if you are um, interested in, in the clinical or bedside aspect of things. And so working on that project, I got to really get to know both of my mentors, ask them questions about what their career looks like every day, really develop that relationship. And I totally echo Leanne, even though I'm clear across the country, I'm on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, I could not have imagined um, even coming close to earning or being in this role that I'm in now without their mentorship on what this work looks like, how to apply, how to do it. I mean, I did practice interview questions with my mentors as well. So incredibly, incredibly helpful. And then in terms of what it's like to be a nurse at the program, I definitely went in nervous because not uncommon you hear in a nurse's experience that maybe you don't feel like medical school is a place that you would just like, you know, fit right in super casually. And it really blew me away. I actually remember I cried happy tears, embarrassing to admit, but I'll tell you, I cried happy tears um, to one of those two mentors after the second week of classes, because I told her I just felt so included and so welcomed. And there's so many moments in class where professors will say, you know, we're talking about X, Y, and Z at the bedside. And then they'll pan to whoever's in the class that has that lived experience and say, hey, like, you've seen a, you know, I used to do pediatric hospice. You've held a patient's hand as they're dying. You know, talk us through that piece. What were the ethical issues you faced? So I never felt like being a nurse was, um, I never felt out of place at a medical school, which I think says a lot about Harvard's culture, especially this program's culture. I'm not sure that that's the case how, or if I would feel that way at every medical school across the country, uh, to be sure. But no, I felt like it was nothing but a good thing to bring. And I also still have a lot of close relationships with people who were also nurses in the program and we've kind of stuck together. So definitely would recommend it from the nursing angle. Great, thanks. And Hajang, you came in as sort of a, at a pretty formative time in your career, looking at how to bring together your academic background in religion, your interest in culture and, um, uh, and immigrant health, um, as well as this growing, um, gr growing desire to study bioethics. And so, um, you know, how, uh, what was your mentorship experience like and uh, how do you see where it's gotten you to today? And um, maybe tell us a little bit about now, now that you've been in your position for uh, a long time, uh, how you bring that to your own students um, in fostering a love of bioethics. Um. <laughs> Uh, after I came to this institution, actually, our bioethics program uh, was growing because I started to offer like more classes like um, pandemic ethics and law, like public health ethics, reproductive ethics, global bioethics. So I tried to bring uh, more global perspectives. And as an uh, as a first generation immigrant, I tried to bring like immigrants, undocumented issues and all that. And uh, during my uh, MBE program, I think it, it's going to be changed as like science in uh, bioethics, <laughs> I just read. Um, I was conducting uh, a research on uh, undocumented immigrants, like, you know, health issues. And I was uh, conducting some like survey of uh, quantitative research. And I faced some challenge to <laughs> finish that um, research. And uh, <laughs> Becca met me and <laughs> uh, like after her work hour, like she was looking for like a, a mentor for me and she tried to connect me to 
uh, people that uh, uh, who can be really helpful. And she was like totally on the student side. And I still like, I'm still so grateful <laughs> uh, for that to, you know, think of that kind of like mentorship. So when I teach my students and when I students uh, conduct some independent research or summer research, and I try to support them and like emotionally and uh, with like network and everything. And I thought that was like really good model, like role model as a mentor. And uh, I was working with uh, Biju Galea, uh, and he was a great mentor as well. And so like one of the lessons that I learned was like, um, like don't, you know, give up your research when you like face challenges, because it's not easy to conduct research for the marginalized communities, like silence communities. So, I mean, he addressed that issue like with uh, sincerity. So not only like knowledge and what I've learned uh, from the research, but also like that kind of mentorship and kind of sincere heart for uh, care for human beings really touched me actually. And, and I've also learned a lot from uh, other uh, faculty members and who actually have the experiences in bioethics on the hospital floor or at the labs. So when I you know, read bioethical materials, like a lot of them are just philosophical, theological, and um, abstract kind of concepts. And I appreciate that, but I felt like I needed more. I need to learn like, you know, what is going on on the hospital floor and what are their lived experiences were like. And a lot of uh, faculty members always brought their experiences and not only faculty members, but our cohorts, like who had lots of experiences in nursing, uh, medicine, like clinicians, and like they brought their expertise. So we have learned uh, from each other a lot as well. So that's uh, something that I really appreciate about the program. Thank you. Um, that's that's really um, helpful to hear. And um, I'm. Uh, it was not a plant of a question to <laughs> to talk about anybody in particular um, and their mentorship. But I, you know, I do. Um, there's a question about the culture of our program and about um, about what it's like to be a student. And um, you know, do, does the group. Uh, does a group come together and what about students from different backgrounds so that begins to touch on it and um, we'll we'll come back we'll come back to that as well when I think about that Vince I have to go to you I, I kind of would like you to tell people about uh, foundations of bioethics bingo to give people a sense that we take our work very seriously uh, but we also um, uh, we also have good fun and have community but um but maybe there's a way of tying that. Um, I really, really love to hear now that you're um, at least ankle deep in your position, how you're learning in your capstone and what you looked at, um, you're integrating into your work, your work as well. Well, thank you very much. The, my capstone mentor was Dr. Lisa Moses, fantastic individual just so knowledgeable. The capstone project that I focused on was looking at the inclusion of chaplains on health healthcare ethics committees and consultation committees, oddly enough, exactly what I was going to be doing. So I would say the capstone uh, project that I worked on directly applied and uh, with Dr. Moses's help and also the other individuals in our capstone seminar, uh, we crafted a, I crafted a pilot study. They helped uh, tighten the questions a little bit and then being able to access the individuals that are part of the uh, Harvard hospital groups that we were able to survey the ethics committee members in those facilities to get their feedback on their impressions of chaplains on healthcare ethics committees. So taking that pilot study, Dr. Moses is still encouraging me to take this to a full blown study and publish the results because we thought they were very interesting and they are. It's just, uh, I really don't have as much time to focus on this as I, I did about a year ago. So it's, while it's one of those backplate burner ideas, we're not making a whole lot of forward progress at this point, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. And speaking of community with our capstone seminar, the five of us that were uh, menteed by Dr. Moses, we're still getting together about once every two months through the wonders of Zoom as we are 
all over the world because I'm out in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Miyoke is back, I believe, in Singapore, and Nina is in Switzerland, and uh, I think Rishali. I don't know exactly where she is in the world, but none of us are connected you know, geographically anymore, but we still have this opportunity to get together. Dr. Moses has still been instrumental in setting that up and finding times that work for all of us. So it has, it has been fantastic. And um, as Dr. Brendel did mention, a bioethics bingo, a buzzword bingo. Um, she had never heard of this and neither had Dr. Barry. So there was one of the last classroom presentations that they led in foundations too. And uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, aggressive match of buzzword bingo waiting for the instructors to say keywords that they had said throughout the entire term. And it was very competitive amongst us in the classroom that was listening to this. So if you've, if you've never seen this, uh, it, it was quite the scene, but it, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. Over. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Vince. And so um, uh, we have so many questions now coming in um, into the, the panel. So Leanne, I'm going to give you a chance to jump in on, cult, on the culture question, because you, um, uh, you had the experience as a student, and now you've come back on uh, in a leadership role in clinical ethics in the center. And maybe you could give us the perspective um, on, on both sides of that, of what the center is like and what it's like to be part of the bioethics community at Harvard Medical School. Sure. Um... I think this has been touched on a bit by most of the panelists, but overall, the culture at the medical school and the program in general has just been really welcoming. Um, like Kayla said, you know, well, I will say coming in as a nurse, I, I was a little worried, a uh, little, little um, nerve wracked, I guess, because, you know, I felt out of place. I, I definitely had imposter syndrome. That was all just my issue. It had nothing to do with HMS or the program. It was just something that I struggled with. And I, I believe the only reason why I got over that was because of the culture and the, the welcoming nature and the inclusivity of everybody in the program. Um, you know, I also felt like what I brought to the table and, and the value that I added to, to my class was very, um, was really appreciated and they they just really valued my hands-on um, life and work experience since many of them you know they they have never worked in healthcare they've never taken care of patients they are half my age you know so they don't don't have that lived experience um but I I really feel and even coming back in as a as a faculty member it's still very inclusive it's like a bunch of friends truly we just chat and where we throw ideas out there and we bounce ideas off of each other and the the dialogue that we have is is really wonderful and um just enlightening and i feel like just having these relationship with everybody has it, it, it makes me think more and it makes me just value um this community tremendously so thanks over <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks so much. So we we just have a um, uh, a few minutes to answer some more questions from the chat. We've actually covered aspects of many of them. One of the things we haven't really talked about is electives and how how people picked elective courses and what their favorite course was. So maybe we could do a little bit of a lightning round. Um, what was either you know some question about how you picked an elective, what you thought was most valuable, the thing you were most surprised by, um, and 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 um, and or any class you uh, wished you had taken that you perhaps didn't consider. Um, any one of those questions, but maybe we could get, uh, uh, I'll go in the order of my screen, but maybe we could um, get some insight for our applicants about all the opportunities in electives. So let me go ahead and we'll go backwards now. Leanne, we'll start with you. So as you can imagine, I heavily um, leaned towards the clinical ethics related classes and tried to stay away from the <laughs> non-clinical ethics uh, classes because I was scared you know I'll just be honest I, it was it, 
it, it was all foreign to me and I was I was worried I wanted to kind of take the easiest route first but I will say the one non-clinical ethics course that I took that I thought was incredible and surprised me that I thought this was incredible was health law and policy um, I thought I was going to take the course and learn, have to learn all about um, case law and things that I knew nothing about. And I learned a ton, but it was so interesting. And the way that it was taught um, was really um, applicable and great. So recommend that. Great. Um, Vince, your take on electives. There were a lot to choose from. The, my favorite one that I, I enjoyed was narrative ethics. Uh, that was fantastic because I enjoy stories and, and that was wonderful. And it certainly opened up a greater understanding of, of individuals' uh, ethical issues. Uh, the, I wish I would have taken more on clinical ethics. Uh, they were there, but you know, schedules just didn't allow that because of all the other classes that were required and it, it didn't line up as well as I would have liked. And because I'm extremely shallow and it was Harvard, I took an elective over at the Divinity School because um, I've always wanted to go there. So I took one that looked at it. It, it had to do more with environmental ethics and uh, catastrophe and the marginalization of vulnerable populations in parts of the world that are destroyed by catastrophic events. Over. All right, um, Kaki, your favorite elective, or the thing you, or your FOMO elective, the one you you were uh, upset you missed out on. Uh, yes, so I, as you can imagine, I lean towards the public health um, elective. So I took global health bioethics, and I really, really enjoyed that. And um, one course that I do wish I had taken was neuroethics, um, and. Um, and another thing too, I want to highlight is that I also cross-registered. Um, so one thing about being in the um, MB program is that you can cross-register across any school at Harvard and I think even MIT and Tufts. And so I took a class at the business school actually that was surprising and very interesting. And um, it also gave me the opportunity to meet other students across uh, across campus and um, just build relationships. So I would highly ad uh, recommend looking at courses in other schools as well. But the program has really a really nice selection of, elect of electives in different disciplines that I think are, are really valuable to look into. Great. Um, Hajang, your experience with electives. Uh, I think my favorite elective was writing course uh, with Dr. Montello. And I think it was several of us uh, taking classes it was like a tiny class. And sometimes we met at a student's house or other times like we met on Zoom and uh, we are working on like, um, like on the topic of our interest and giving some feedback. And it was like really nice group, a great mentor. So I think that was the, the probably uh, best experience in elective and I wish I could take the class about like religion culture I think there was a class but uh, I had a time conflict so I was not able to take it but I'm like teaching those materials now great um and uh Kayla do you want to round us out yeah absolutely my two favorites were definitely ethics and reproductive medicine and also health and human rights I do wish I had taken narrative ethics because I find that I do a lot of sitting with patients and families at the bedside. And I think the skills of knowing how to sort of understand how someone's life story, their own narrative affects everything that they're facing in the hospital would be really helpful. So definitely, if I could go back, I would take narrative ethics as well. Great. Um, so we are coming uh, towards the end of our time together, believe it or not. I feel like we're just getting started and I'm even learning new things about each of you and about, about the program as much time as we've spent together. So I really want to thank you for uh, being here, sharing your experience and uh, passing it forward to uh, the next generations of MBE students. Um, before we move, I turn this back over to Jesse. I want to acknowledge the other members of the education team who make our, the, the program possible um, each and every day, day in and day out, um, and are, if not uh, on in the front of the scene, always behind the, the scenes. So our Associate Director of Education, Crystal Chang, uh, Sam Picken, um, uh, our specialist in education, Kelsey Berry, co-director um, 
of the master's program and associate faculty director of the MBE. Um, in addition to Jesse, wanted to make sure that um, as everything good that happens in bioethics, this is a, uh, a major team effort. And with that, let me hand it back to Jesse to bring us to a close of our panel with, again, my gratitude to uh, uh, alumni slash uh, new colleagues uh, in the field of bioethics in our growing community. Jesse? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Brendel, um, and thank you to the panelists. That was wonderful. I do just want to round us off here quickly looking at the deadline and some of what we're asking for your application. It does seem that many of you have already applied. Um, that's wonderful, but hopefully some of you are here and you have now been convinced and this is something that you really would like to do. So March 15th is our next deadline. That is exactly a month away from today. Um, <clears throat> our online applications, they consist of you having to submit your CV, a statement of purpose, and three letters of recommendation, as well as your transcripts from all of the institutions that you have attended. There is a $100 application fee, um, and all of your test scores that you might have had, like your GRE or your MCAT, those are completely optional, okay? So upload them if you want, like if you have a test score, but it is now expired, you don't have to worry about it. If you are an international applicant and you did not study somewhere where the language of instruction was English, you will have to submit a language proficiency exam score. Um, if you're worried about this being last minute, the Duolingo uh, proficiency test, that takes very little time and you'll also get your scores back very, very quickly, okay? So for more information, uh, we do have a center YouTube channel on this. We have our other general information sessions. We also have a student panel experience uh, where we heard from current students um, about the things that they've done this year. Uh, and a lot of people really enjoyed that. That's on our YouTube channel. There's also over the years we've put on events and there's a range um, of topics and a range of lectures that you might be interested in. And that could really give you a good idea for some of the stuff that the center does here. Um, so before we end it, thank you, everybody. Um, we did answer a lot of questions in the Q&A. We, we typed these out. So please just take a last couple of seconds to look through that. Um, we tried to get to everything. And some of the questions that were also typed out, I, you know, I can let me speak to those now so everybody can hear them. Um, if you applied January 15th to that first deadline, we, we usually look to have decisions out four to six weeks later. So we're looking at early March. Um, for the March 15th deadline, decisions will be that same timeline, four to six weeks from March 15th, okay? Our admission standards are the same regardless of if you apply to study in person or virtually. Um, and then there was also a question regarding when do we start the capstone? So if you are studying full time, that's going to take, right, you're going to do that pretty much right at the beginning, um, all along with your courses throughout the year. If you're studying part time over two years, the bulk of what you're doing with your capstone happens in the second year. Um, if you're not located on Eastern time, the foundations classes, if, you, if you're taking this for the part-time online foundations classes and our core classes are usually 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time, okay? And then the electives are about the same time, but they can start sometimes at 4 o'clock. So I hope you all um, have enjoyed this session. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much to our panelists and our wonderful alumni for joining. Uh, thank you to Crystal and Sam, our program staff, and thank you to Dr. Brindell for moderating today. I hope you all have a lovely day. Goodbye, everybody.